Hello, my name is Dr. Kenyon Williams. I'm professor of percussion here at Minnesota State University, Moorhead. Today I'd like to walk you through the Minnesota 2020 through 21 all-state audition excerpts. Specifically today, we're going to be looking at timpani. Now, timpani is a very complex, fascinating instrument to study. I highly encourage you, if at all possible, find an applied percussion teacher near you and ask them to help you with many of the nuances. Today I'm going to go very quickly through just a few of them to help you and specifically focus upon the piece that we have to play for this year's audition excerpts. First off, when you hold the mallets, one of the main things you want to think about is your grip. The grip that I prefer to use is called French grip. Unlike snare drum grip where the back of the hand's flat, the thumb is on top and the mallet is held in the butt, the butt of the mallet is held in the palm of the hand. So I have a full relaxed stroke. So when I strike the drum, it's a nice, full, relaxed sound and I want to come off for what's called a legato stroke. For a staccato stroke, grasp the fingers tightly around the mallet and snap the wrist. This gives me more of a thump, more of a ta sound versus a la sound for legato. So legato, staccato. Going to give you a little bit sharper sound. Always thinking full stroke. One of the main things that I want to see in any good timpanist is a smooth stroke that comes off the drum. Oftentimes beginners play drum timpani like a set of toms. In other words, and this is exactly the wrong way to play timpani. Instead, thinking off the drum. And notice, in general, when I strike the drum, about a third of the way in from the edge, and also about a dollar bill apart. So if there's my mallets, right there, nice and relaxed, and generally kind of parallel to each other, rather than playing like this. You can play tim like this, it's called German grip and a German approach, but in general I play more the French style. Coming off, more relaxed, full strokes with a thumb on top, no back fingers, just letting it rebound. Unless, of course, I want that staccato sound with back fingers on, sharp and sharp and quick. All right. Now, two things that are most important to timpani when you get started. Number one, make sure you have mallets that fit the piece. If I simply grab the first pair of mallets in my high school band cabinet, chances are they're not going to be my best choice. When I look at this composition, I see an awful lot of 16th notes. I see a few rolls. I see a few long notes. So I want something that's going to be right in the middle that allows me to get smooth rolls, but also lets me articulate very cleanly those 16th note passages. So I'm going to choose more of a medium, or in this case, maybe a little medium hard mallet. I have some innovative fours here. These are a little bit on the harder side. They're going to give me just a little bit more of a punch. These are bamboo, sh bamboo shaft mallets. I like bamboo for a little lighter, but innovative also makes some wonderful harder cherry wood mallets that are, that are great for a piece like this. But when I play with this lighter mallet, I want a nice light touch. But I still want to make sure I have an articulate enough sound for those sixteenths. So again, medium to medium hard. I'm not going to go for an ultra staccato mallet. If I do that, then my middle roll section is going to sound very ticky ticky ticky. And I want to have enough felt on the end to give me a nice warm roll during the rolls that happen in the middle of the piece. All right. Now, the next most important thing on timpani, I don't have my mallet selected, I have my grip and my stroke, I want to make sure I can tune. Now, this is where a lot of students make a mistake. They assume they can tune because they use the gauges. Well, these gauges are more often than not very, very wrong. You want to learn to tune by ear. And let me show you a little trick that I learned years ago that helps me tune and teach students to tune very quickly. I call it the bad country singer method. And it goes like this. First off, get the pitch. So, for example, if I'm going to tune, I may tune with a pitch pipe or a pitch fork. More advanced students should learn to use a pitch fork, but when you're just getting started, a pitch pipe is ideal. Uh, try to use this rather than a bell kit or a vibraphone in your band hall. That's the old standby many of us use, but the problem with that is, of course, you're in the middle of band and you're yelling across the section, hey, Jim, play me a B flat, or hey, Sue, play me an F, and that just is very unprofessional. Of course, it doesn't work when you have a bunch of other people making noise in the band hall. So getting your own pitch pipe, which is all of about $10 your local music store, the same kind they use in a choir or in an a cappella vocal group, very useful, good to have your own bag. Now, a pitch fork is something you play, and I can then put in my ear and listen and hear the pitch very cleanly. Now, this is an A440 pitch fork, so if I want to tune an A on this drum, which is my 29 inch, that should be roughly in the middle of the drum. So here's what I would do. First off, I would make sure that the pedal's at the very bottom of the position, and I'm going to pedal up very quickly to the note. And I'm also going to always, if I pedal past the note, always start over and go down. The, many for, the reasons for that are many. I'm not going to get into them for time's sake. But just to say if I go past the note, start over again at the bottom. Now, here's the bad country singer method. Think of this. 
If I'm a country singer, oftentimes I sing with a bad technique. Many country singers sing, they scoop into their pitches. I love my girl and my dog and my truck and my beer. And I can sing like that because I'm from Texas. Believe me, I grew up with that. So when you have those sounds, that's actually a great way to learn how to tune timpani. So for example, if I hit my A, which sings la, I first off I'm gonna sing the pitch straight. La, then I'm gonna sing like a bad country singer. Lua. So scoop into that, try it with me. Sing la, now sing. Lua. Now, if I then imitate that sound with the pedal, I'm going to hit the drum once to get it vibrating. And there's my A. I'm going to hit it one more time just to make sure it's right. And sure enough, there it is. Now, ideally, I would tune very quickly and quietly. I wouldn't do this. But rather, I would tune like this. Get my pitch pipe, or pitch fork. Get my pitch, sing it in my head. Then maybe quiet if I need to under my breath. Or better yet, do it in my head. And then as quietly as I can, one time to check it. There we go. Now notice, ideally, the judge should not be able to hear me tune at all. Now since you guys are doing recordings for all state auditions, they're not going to hear this tuning process. But you want to practice it. Why? Being able to tune timpani is just as important to be able to play the notes. I was very fortunate to stay with the great Al Leepak, a Minnesota, a, excuse me, a Percussive Art Society Hall of Fame timpanist, one of the first authors of one of the very first timpani textbooks ever published. And one thing he drilled into my head over and over was that if you are not playing the timpani in tune, you're simply not playing the timpani. Unlike a snare drum, or unlike a, a bass drum, where I'm focused on mainly rhythm, 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 here I've, I'm more of a brass instrument. I'm like the tuba or trombone. It doesn't matter how accurate the rhythm or the dynamics are if they're playing the wrong notes. Same thing with timpani. The right note is good tuning, so I have to make sure I can properly tune. So I'm going to go ahead and tune my pitches here. I've got G. I'm going to retune. i got my A here. I'm going to sing. I'm going to tune my C. and then I'm gonna tune my F, which is already in place. So, I have those pitches in place, I put my pitch fork or pitch pipe down, and now I'm ready to tune. One, I'm ready to play. One more thing to be aware of, I should have what's called a perfect fourth between each interval. A perfect fourth is an interval where I go up the scale, if I'm in the, the key of G, go up G, A, B, C, I'm a four notes. Go up four notes then from C, C, D, E, F, I'm, that's F, so that's fourth, those are called perfect fourths. So. Perfect fourths are easily identified by one of two measures. If I go up, the song, Here Comes the Bride. Here comes the bride. If I got my C, I should have a nice clean, Here Comes the Bride. And I like that one. There, I got a nice one. Now, if I go down, another interval that uses that is George of the Jungle. So I got my nice. Uh, perfect fourth interval there when I'm tuning those. All right. Oh, I want to double check. I thought I heard something. And like I said, I want to be as accurate as I can, get my tuning just right before I hit the record button for my video, All, for my uh, Allstate audition. Now, we have our stroke, relaxed legato strokes, playing area nailed, about a dollar bill apart, a third of the way in, thumb on top, and I've got good tuning. Perfect fours. I've chosen to use the bottom three drums. This piece can be played on the top three as well, but you have a bit of a devil's problem here. If I play on the bottom three drums, the pitches are all at the top of the range of each one, so it's a little pingy. But if I choose the top three drums, the pitches are all at the bottom range of the top, these two drums, so I get a low, thumpy, flubby sound. Honestly, I tend to lean towards more a pingy sound than a flubby sound, so I'm gonna perfectly choose to play these, this, this excerpt here, on the bottom three drums. Now, as I move forward with the piece, I'm going to work through a little piece at a time. Make sure you're recording and practicing, excuse me, with a metronome. Super important. The big mistake a lot of folks are going to make when they play this piece is they're going to play it too fast. It looks and feels like it should be going very quickly. But if I'm using my metronome, it's actually andante. Andante means walking speed, nice and slow. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Not as quick as you may think. So I'm going to play a little bit of the beginning for you with the metronome, and notice how relaxed the tempo really is. Ready? And. I'm going to stop right there. 
Notice what I did. First off, mezzo forte. I want to play solid, but I don't want to play for obnoxious forte. Nice mezzo forte. Notice my sticking, alternating. Right, 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 right. Alternate sticking is always preferable on timpani. Try not to play diddles. Now, that means when I get to my second bar, I really want to avoid a sticking like this. I could play that, but in a good timpani technique, instead you would typically use what's called cross sticking. Cross sticking, right, and I'm going to alternate. Now the big danger of cross sticking is making sure that I am getting a good playing area every time. If I'm not careful, I will get something like this. in all sorts of weird positions. I always want to be aiming for that prime location where I'm striking. And cross sticking, it doesn't give me an excuse. I still have to get that good stroke. With a good legato tone coming off the drum. All right, so alternate strokes, good playing area. And notice on cross sticking, finally, when I do cross stick, try to cross at the wrist. Sometimes, yes, especially for big ones, I'll have to cross a little more at the elbow. But in general, I want to be here. And finally, when you cross stick, try to make sure when you strike the drum, I'm striking just like I normally would, where at the point of impact, the mallet is parallel to the head. This gives me a full fat sound rather than a thin tip of the mallet sound. I get a full fat sound. So if I'm cross sticking, I want to be at that same location, not where I've got kind of the tip of the mallet here at an angle. It's not going to give me the full fat tone I want like that. So keep the wrist low, cross at the wrist if, as much as possible. Okay, moving on into the second line now. So one, one and two, three, one and two, three. Notice the end of that bar right there. I have a nice little cross sticking passage. I want to be sure and be ready for that. So here I go. I'm going to play that second line. One, two, three, go. So notice I came out nice and strong on forte. Now we have an interesting problem, the forte piano roll. On timpani, there's many ways to play a forte piano roll. The two primary ways would be to strike the drum and then to sneak in underneath it while it's still ringing. So I literally stop rolling for just a moment, sneak in, and that gives me a nice crescendoed roll. Another way to do it would be to do a continuous roll, but immediately just get softer. Now I want to honestly Find which one works best for my own sound, my own technique. Different students, I tell different things. So a student can do this really well, and I tell them to do that. Other students, I had them try. So go with the sound that sounds best, and also the one that sounds best with the music itself. Um, by the way, the good way to get the sound of your ear, you hear this all the time growing up on television. Tonight, from The Daily Show, we have John Stewart. So that sound, that big attack, and then roll out. These are fairly short forte piano rolls, so we can't take too long to let it sit there. It's got a pretty quick crescendo coming out of it. So just be ready for that. Again, nice, smooth, even roll. Careful not to roll too fast. Many students try to get a fast roll, and they do that. They tense up, and when they roll too fast, they get an uneven and very tense roll. But I should focus on a slower, continuous sound, rather than fast and uneven. Slow and even is always preferable to fast and uneven especially on timpani and mallet rolls. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to the third line of the etude now, and here we get to some interesting sticking issues. One of the key things about timpani is you want to make sure you really know your stickings. Take the time to mark in your stickings. I don't know if you can see a little bit there, but I've taken the time to write rights and lefts and diddles and all sorts of things that really give a sense of what I'm going to play. I don't want to guess every time I practice which sticking is going where. That's going to throw off my rhythm, it's going to throw off my tone, and ultimately it's going to hurt the way I play the excerpt. So I've taken careful time to go through and write a few stickings in. So if I start at the beginning of the uh, third line, excuse me, third line, second measure, I'm going to start on beat two, right in the mezzo forte. I'm going to use my metronome, make sure I'm not rushing again. One and three, one and three. There's my pulse on the mezzo forte. One and three, one, ready, go.
Now notice I threw in a little cross stick at the end of the third line, third me last measure. Why the cross stick there? Because if I start with my left hand, I get into a bit of an octopus uh, uh, mix-up, especially when I'm trying to keep that right, left, left, right, alternating sticking as much as possible. Cross sticking is good, but you don't want to cross stick, as, you want to cross stick as little as possible. Ideally, you'll play much more naturally like this with a more natural tone than if I'm trying to play this sort of thing all the time. They're not marching tenors. I don't want to try to look good. I want to try to sound good. All right. Now, going on now to my fourth line here, starting on the forte piano roll again. This is beat two, the last measure of the fourth line. Ready and go. what I did there on the second to last line. In the second measure, I dampen the outer two notes to let the middle note ring, and then I'm going to, with the notation there, that slash means let ring. Don't dampen it. So one more time. Now, these other notes are dampened, so I don't have the extra ringing. It's going to give me a pure sound on my C. But in the last measure, there's no ringing mark, so they have an actual rest. So here's the first time in the piece I want to do a real dampening. Now, to dampen on timpani, use the back three fingers, use the skin closest to the fingernail, and make sure you dampen where you struck the drum. In other words, right there. If I dampen where I didn't strike the drum, it doesn't work. The drum keeps ringing. So I want to be sure to dampen right where I struck. That gives me the immediate cutoff. Be careful your dampening isn't louder than the actual sound itself. In other words, no, we want to do that quietly as we can. There is going to be some sound, no matter what I do, especially if the head is really loose and on lower part of its range where it's flopping a lot. It's going to be a lot of buzz. But you do it, practice dampening so that you're getting the most quiet, quick sound you can instead of that sort of tank sound we don't want. All right. Now, let's take a look at the very last portion of the etude now. If I start on the second to last line on the mezzo forte, this is the last measure, the second to last line. So I have some dampening, and I'm going to lead it now into my very final line. Notice that second to last bar, woo, has some very tricky little sticking. So I'm going to play it slowly for you and demonstrate it. So here I go, starting at the mezzo forte, second to last line. Actually, I'll do it at tempo, because it is a fairly relaxed tempo. One, two, ready, and go. First off, alternating left hand first. One and two and three and one. Crescendo. Dampen the other drums, then dampen this one. If I don't dampen the other drums, then I get this effect. These drums are still ringing. So I want to make sure when the notes are cut off, it's an actual complete cutoff. Ah, that's the sound I want right there. Okay, I hope you found this helpful, and once again, I hope that you take the time to find a private instructor who can walk you through the true nuances of the stroke and the grip and the roll and how to tune. Timpani are a fun instrument. They are the king of the orchestra, and they deserve to be treated like kings or queens, and they need to be treated uh, with utmost respect. And to do that, you want to find a private teacher, if at all possible. If not, I really, really encourage you, in this day and age, Find a teacher, if you can't find one nearby, find one on Zoom. Find someone who will coach you from a distance. Anything is better than trying to figure it out all on your own. All right, take care, good luck at the auditions this year, and I hope you found this helpful.